All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Global Game Changer Summit. And we're having an exclusive roundtable discussion with our very wonderful human being and my hopefully my good friend. I want to think of friends. <laughs> Mr. Matt Desh, who is the CEO of Iridium. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick intro, Matt, if that's all right with you before okay. I say hi. Uh, but with over 40 years of experience in the telecommunications industry and formerly at AT&T, Nortel Networks, and SAIC Telecordia, Matt is a super knowledgeable expert in the telecommunications and satellite space. He successfully has run Iridium over the past 17 years. I saw that you even won Satellite Executive of the Year Award twice. Right. Uh, you're also a member of the U.S. President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Community, which is NSTEC. I hope I'm saying that right. He's a board director of Unisys, as well as a member of the Space and Satellites Professionals International Hall of Fame. What? You are on a Hall of Fame thing? That is like so cool. That's like every rock and roller's dream, but you're, you got it one step better. You're on the International Satellite and Space Hall of Fame. I think that's what a lot of us aspire to be. I don't think that's better, but thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much for doing this, and thank you for taking the time to speak with oh. us. Thanks for having me here. Uh, and yes, we are friends. It's our one year friend, 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 anniversary. Yeah, <laughs> friend anniversary. So yes, thank you for having me. Yes, I, I seriously, I think that's like the biggest uh, flex that you should have, which is being on the Hall of Fame. That one is pretty cool, though. I think that should be the first thing that you say, like, did you know there's a space Hall of Fame and I'm on it? But anywho, I thought we since we could have a little fun icebreaker to get to warm ourselves up, although <laughs> I feel like our audiences around the world, we've got to get to know each other. We've got to get to know Mr. Matt Desh. So here are some fun icebreaker questions for you to answer and that our audience can answer along with us in the chat. Okay, so as you can see, I took the liberty of making it a bit space theme. But the first question, Matt, in our icebreaker, would you rather fly a fighter jet or travel into space? If you had to choose one, what would it be? I bet you know me well enough to know what I. I do. Say. I think I know. I I think I know unanimously what you would vote for. Like any day yeah. you would vote for. Well. <laughs> Someday I want to travel into space, and I'm going to do it as soon as Elon Musk has his mother go into space on his, his <laughs> rocket, because I'll know it'd be safe. But I really would want to fly a fighter jet, because, you know, I've been uh, passionate about aviation for like 50 years and fly everywhere myself, even even flying a helicopter now. So I'm really, uh, I love anything that goes in the air, including if it goes way up in the air, even in this space, but uh, definitely if I can fly it myself. Since you are basically an expert, right? I think you've probably been driving a, like piloting a plane longer than I've been driving a car, right? And you're probably way better at both of it. My question is, is there like a threshold that you need to meet when you're flying in like airspace? And like, what's like the threshold that you've been on that you find accelerating or? Well, um, I have flown all kinds of things, you know, which I'm fortunate. Um, I have flown for over 50 years. In fact, I got my... Uh, I started flying when I was 13 and oh, I, got, wow. I, I soloed an airplane all by myself with no one in what? the airplane when I was 16 years old. So, um, you know, anybody can clearly do that. You can solo a glider when you're 14. Uh, but I got my license when I was in high school, when I was 18. And I thought I'd be the coolest kid ever because I could fly. You could airplane. have been. Yeah. <laughs> the problem was I wasn't very cool to begin with. And uh, I was just a nerd who liked to fly. But I've I've loved it ever since. I love anything to go up. I've been up in balloons. I've been in helicopters. I've been in jets and been into um, all over the world. I've gotten to fly in really interesting places, and uh, including from Europe all the way to the U.S. across to Iceland and Greenland and and that way. So um, I I just love anything in the air. That sounds super cool. I don't know if I I, I agree with you because I have a little bit of flying phobia but it sounds very cool that just from hearing your experiences i'm like maybe i'd like to do that too but i don't know i don't know we'll see someday we'll go someday we'll go flying and i'll take you someday we'll and, you and i'll have like three seat belts on not because of you it's because of me it's okay <laughs> I okay but yeah my next question for this or that this one is kind of lame i apologize i thought of better questions only later okay so the next question is would you prefer like would you rather have meetings on Zoom 
and or meetings in person. Now, the reason I ask this because I feel like both platforms have its like pros and cons. Like you know, meeting people in person is great, but it takes so much time. What do you think on this? What would you rather do? Oh, absolutely, one thousand percent in person. I. I like people and I like being around them and there's so much you can see. I like to see their knees and their feet to find out that they have those. Um, I am wearing pants, you know, but sometimes on Zoom during the pandemic, you know, you'd be in in a pair of gym shorts or something like that. And uh, it is it is comfortable to be on Zoom, but frankly, it's just not the way to go. You want to see people. I agree. I, I think meeting in person really helps to establish a connection. But Zoom meetings are the one of the most effective mediums I see for getting work done because people are like, "Okay, let's meet. Thirty minutes, we're done. We don't have to like drag out a meeting." I couldn't. Do it I couldn't be here with you if it wasn't for for um, for this. So these that's it's true. made it's made this a lot more possible, and that's great because I can meet with more people around the world here today than uh, if they had to travel to see me or the other way around. So. So I'm, I'm happy right. for it that way. Okay. So, so I think we'll give Zoom a shot, but in-person still works better. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Our last question for our icebreaker session and audience, let us know what you think, because this is the most controversial question I have ever. <laughs> uh, would you, if you could pick, right, would you pick Star Wars or Star Trek? Now, oh, yeah. I feel like this would cause a little war in the chat. Like, but what would you pick? <laughs> Those are fighting, fighting uh, uh, things. People are really adamant about both of them. Um, I agree. <laughs> I, I grew up, first of all, on Star Trek, but I actually went to see the first Star Wars movie uh, when it came out. I was, mm -hmm. I was in high school, I think, or just, just had graduated from high school and saw it, and it just opened up my mind in ways that you know Star Trek didn't. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm a Star Wars person. No, I would have chosen Star Trek. Okay, so I, I had like the reverse experience because like I I was recommended like, why don't you watch the movies, not in the year that it came out, but in how it's supposed to be in the storyline. So I watched one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for the Star Wars movies. And so I didn't get the whole why like Darth Vader is a big deal just because we already knew him as Anakin Skywalker because I started with like the first movie. But when I when I dwelled into the Star Trek series, now the movies were okay, like the the re reboots were all right, but the series was like whoa, like this is like really cool stuff. Especially like I'm a huge fan of Star Trek Voyager, but yeah, See, they didn't have but they didn't have pets on Star Trek, you know. And I want a Wookie, <laughs> I want a Wookie or one of those little uh, those little guys that yeah. run on, uh, what are those uh, Ewoks or whatever they are. So, you know, where are you going to meet other people like that? They were always like evil evil people who wanted to blow you out of the uh, space on on Star Trek. And every now and then it looked like you might want to meet somebody on Star Wars, except for Darth Vader. You wouldn't want to <laughs> I mean, he's kind of interesting of a character. Although yeah. I, I was very fascinated with all the Vulcans and the, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess, okay, that's where we'll, we'll set our differences aside. All right. It's okay. That's all it is. We can still that's be friends. Is. We can still be friends. <laughs> all right, let's, I think that just goes to show that we can end debates and just say you know what we'll just agree that we'll have differences but exactly. yeah <laughs> okay we have our first question from the audience and i hope that you're having a good start to the summit uh one of the things that we would like to hear from you and this question is posed by melissa what is your favorite experience working in some of these telecommunications companies and i think before you take that question i'm just going to ask you how did you transition into someone who was just entering into the workforce into becoming one of the most successful CEOs in like the business world ever. Because like, I think there was like a huge, for me, it looks like a huge jump. Like did it accidentally happen overnight or was it like you planned it all along? Nothing ever happens overnight. No, I, um, I went to college and I got a computer degree. Uh, so I was, I started my career programming computers for the tel telephone system. Uh, I really stumbled into telecommunications back in the day when it was, I mean, we were still only talking on landline phones as they were called in those days, something you would touch from the wall. Most of the people online here probably don't even remember those because they didn't grow up with them. Um, but I, I really wanted to do something big and global and important and something that would help the world. I was really um, fortunate 
to be asked to come into this thing called a cell phone back when they were really big and there weren't many of them. And I wasn't really sure how important it would be, to be honest, but I knew it would be interesting and exciting. And I got to travel all over the world. You know, I, um, I, I think I've been to 45 or 50 countries because everyone needs a cell phone. Everyone and every telephone company needs equipment. And I was in the technology side of it. Uh, my companies were always inventing new, new things. I was in 1G and 2G and 3G, oh, and now wow. we've got 5G and 6G and that sort of thing. But um, but that was exciting. But it was starting to get kind of, uh, I wouldn't say boring, it, but it was slowing down because everything was what we call commoditizing. It was just becoming just like each other. Every company was just like every other company. And I wanted to do something new and fresh. And that's when I joined uh, Iridium 17 years ago. They were still in their very early days. They were a young, small company that had a satellites in space. But I knew if I knew cell phones only covered about 15% of the Earth's surface. Even today, you think if you yeah. have a cell phone, and I know everybody on this line does, but if you think about where you can use it, if you can't use it in the oceans, you can't use it on top of a mountain, you can't use it in a lot of places. Um, you can use it at home and that sort of thing, but people and packages and all kinds of things go out and we need to track them or, or keep people safe. Yeah. So I knew Iridium could do that. So I, I've i loved uh, the fact that we serve 100% of the planet, that we're involved particularly in disasters right now. I've had so many people thank thank me for having a product that can save their lives, you know, because um, they've been in the middle of nowhere and fallen down a crevasse and they had a, a device that could connect to a satellite and tell tell people they needed yeah. help and get rescued. Um, and so that's been really fun to be part of something that's really, really important and, and that the world really needs a lot of. Nice. Oh, and how do you, how do you become a CEO along the way? Well, I think just more and more experience, you know, as I, I, I early on, even when I was in high school and college, I enjoyed going to events. I enjoyed being part of groups, but I naturally, ended up becoming the leader of them, you know, because I found I could shape it a little bit more. I know you have the same feeling. Um, you know, it's fun to go to the party, but to throw the party, then everybody has to really um, thank you and be part of it and that sort of thing. So I found myself throwing the party more than it, than I was just attending them. And even as I started in my career, I, I really, um, I wanted to be part of creating the vision. I wanted to be part of of uh, communicating what it was that we were doing. I wanted to be the one out um, that was creating the right team and it was making a place fun to work and that sort of thing. So, uh, and I think if you want to do something bad enough and you keep working at it, eventually people recognize that you have the, have the talents and skills to do it and you fall into it. And then if you, if you figure out how to do it well, because you've made some mistakes and you've made some successes and you figure out which ones are which, then eventually you find yourself um, running something. And then if you do that well, then they put you in the Hall of Fame. And so <laughs> anyway, anyway but, um, it's been fun and it's been fun to be part of it. And it, again, it's all really about the people involved. I mean, we, we're involved in rockets and satellites and space, but I can tell you what really gets me up every day is the people I work with and the people around the world that we work for and the people who we partner with. That's really what and if you're not doing that, if that's not what you're about, then you should think about whether you really want to be a CEO or really run something, because it's not just about making something or making money or, you know, even doing something important. It's really bigger than that. It's about us as humans getting together and doing something important as a, as a, as a group, you know. That's nice. I think that's something that I'm learning as well over the past couple of days, especially in the summit, is um, the most successful people are successful not because that's what they aim to do. It was because they were people oriented or like they, they wanted to see how could they add value to people or they cared about their clients or their stakeholders or their customers, their team. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I feel like I'm hearing that with your story as well. You're one of the most successful executives in the world who's run a company successfully for almost two decades now not because you were the go-getter and like i need to be the top ceo like to make millions of dollars it's because it was about passion about people and seeing how you could really improve something that you wanted you're passionate about and then obsessively work on making that better until you get that skill set 
I, it, the, even the most, I mean, the most successful companies you can think of, you know, the Amazons and Metas and Googles and, and, and Iridium is, you know, in that category. I mean, all those leaders had visions about what the company could be, but if you didn't have people, if you couldn't motivate people to be part of that, uh, to execute on sort of the vision, if you didn't have people that were smarter than you, that you brought around you and said, you know, Matt, you could do things differently, uh, or we could go a different direction, and you listened to them and you empathized, uh, then I don't think any of them would really be successful. So that's true. Fair point. Now, speaking of people, right, I had this question that I really wanted to ask you, which was we often talk about, I think people, when they see successful organizations or teams, they often see the main leader. And with Iridium, we see you. But what is, who is one person that you would like to credit or thank that was part of shaping your journey into the success of the company? And, yours as well. Who's one person that you feel should get more credit or recognition? Um, well, I mean, uh, I didn't start the company. So, mm -hmm. you know, a company called Motorola back in the 90s, actually the late 80s, actually thought up the idea. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary this week, and it was really fun to be able to bring back some of the people who are getting way up in age oh, who nice. were involved in the 80s and 90s who built it, because it was the first time anyone ever had ever launched satellites into low earth orbit yeah. for on a commercial basis they had done it as spy satellites and stuff obviously not us but to do it commercially for sort of a commercial good no one had ever done that and everybody thought it was a crazy idea and it cost too much and to interconnect them into space and actually create 100 percent coverage nobody had ever done that they still haven't really done that today even though other people have launched satellites into low earth orbit that do different things so I would say, you know, the people who are involved in this company at first and to bring some of those people back, like I brought back the, the founder who uh, brought the company out of bankruptcy 25 years ago, and he's 92 today, but, uh, you know, now, so oh. really, really sharp still. And he was just so happy to be part of it. And I was, I wouldn't be here if he hadn't hired me and said, I think you could take it the next leg here. Um, I thought it would, I would only be with a company three, four, five years at most. And here I am almost 18 years later. Um, uh, and it's just because I've enjoyed it and it's been fun and we've had some success and we've been able to build it and that sort of thing. But it's those people that that hired me and brought me in. I, I really owe a lot of credit to. Nice. Yes. And I do remember we had a Motorola phone as well. So I, I look, look forward to getting a satellite phone next when I ever go on adventurous hikes or deep sea diving, which I'll have to do one day. I know. I know. <laughs> can get you one, Kira. <laughs> oh, who could it be? I wonder who. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> okay. Since I've been going easy on you with the questions, I've got to say we have some questions from our super young audience and they did not go easy. They're pulling out all the technical uh, information. So I hope you're ready. This is I'm our ready. first video question from our 11 year old Ascendance apprentice who is part of our team. Her name is Natlin. Let's hear her question. My name is Natlin and I'm an 11 year old. Ascendant's Apprentice. I have two questions. My first one is, can AI be used to help save space debris and space junk? My second question is, can what small actions can we take to help save space junk or debris? Thank you. I didn't hear that first part, that AIB, she said. Can yeah, AIB she asked, it? okay. So first of all, that's the cutest question I've ever heard in my life. I love that, uh, yeah. <laughs> but she asked two questions. The first one was, could we use AI to clean up oh, the space? Yeah. Yes. The debris that's floating around. I think referring to your keynote that she heard a little bit earlier. And I think the second thing is, how can we everyday people play a part in it? And I know that Iridium's doing great stuff with the Net Zero Initiative. Uh, I think, so how could we do it, get involved as well? Those are great questions, really. Um, the first one actually is a really smart question. And we are using AI today. Um, you know, today we're launching as an industry so many satellites into space. You know, uh, when I got into the company 16, 17 years ago, there were only 3,000 satellites in orbit. And, and that there have been many, many more, but satellites only last about 10 to 15 years at most in space. And then they need to either be, if they're launched in very low orbit, they either need to be brought down to burn up in the atmosphere or they need to be pushed very far away from the earth so they don't get in anyone's way. And there were only 3,000 satellites, but now there's 
10,000, 15,000, there's going to be 30,000 satellites here in the next couple of years. So there's so many of them coming around, especially in low Earth orbit, that it's almost too, too much information to move them away from trouble. We're now tracking as mo most of those satellites in space, and we tell the operators who have those space in a couple of days if we think if it's going to compute that two things are going to get close together, and that way they can move them one way or the other. But with so many satellites, it's almost hard to for people mm -hmm. to keep up with it. And AI can start doing that. AI can start taking over that job. And I think that will help keep things away from each other. Because what's really important these days, since it's so hard to clean up space, what, what's already up there, it's, it's important that we don't add any more debris into space. We don't let anything else run into each other. We don't shoot anything down in space. That's really, really critical. So that's a really good question. AI is absolutely something that can help a lot. Uh, in those things. And the second one was, uh, what can anybody do? Every, mm -hmm. Everybody, I mean, I think uh, as everyone gets a voice in their governments and has a, everyone has a voice really to advocate for what you care about. And I think if you advocate that governments, um, first of all, communicate where your satellites are. Um, right now, we're really we're really communicating very well for most of the country, most of the world uh, countries of the world. But like China and Russia won't tell us what they're doing with their satellites right now. And so they're kind of a mystery to everybody else in the industry. And we worry that not knowing anything about where they're moving their satellites, you know, we can see their satellites. So it's not a big mystery as to what they're uh, up there. I mean, they're they're not secret. You can't keep your There's satellite. no Harry Potter invisible cloak that's hiding no, those satellites. There's no invisible cloak yet. Um, they're even stealthily, you know, kind of where these things are, but you don't know if they're going to move them left or right, or they're going to move them up in their orbits or down. And that's really important information to give to the rest of us so we can recompute where your satellites are going to go and if they're going to get to, close to our satellites. So I think it's just important that everyone say, we need to contribute together because this is a problem that only the whole world can solve. No satellites stay up over your country unless they're unless you live at the equator and they're very, very far away satellites because those satellites stay kind of, even though they're going fast, the earth is moving and they stay right over your country. But every other satellite, particularly all these satellites in low earth orbit, they're going around the planet every 100 minutes or so, between 90 and 110 minutes. So. It's only going across the sky from eight to 12 minutes and the next one's coming over and there's coming all over. So oh you my can't. God. <laughs> so if you wanted to take one of those out, it, it's not going to help you because eight to 10 minutes, it's going to be over some other country. So, <laughs> so, anyway, um, so we all got to work together on this problem. So there's literally like hundreds of things, thousands of things flying across me right now above the sky. And I'm just, I just want, I'm not noticing it. <laughs> you don't see them, except uh, you can see some satellites right as it gets dark. Uh, just as it turns dark, there's apps you can find. Uh, people love to see the International Space Station. They love to watch uh, Starlink satellites now, or, or there's a lot of them, so you can often see them. We, our satellites used to be more visible at that time, our old satellites, because they had big, they were called flares and people would actually look in the sky and compute, your app would compute right when you see it. It was a great, great fun thing to do. Uh, unfortunately, we deorbited all those satellites so that they wouldn't become debris. So they don't, <laughs> uh, our new satellites don't, don't create those same flares. Just like speaking of satellites, like does Iridium satellites need to worry about sustainability in terms of like the typical like down on earth problems like fuel consumption or like eco-friendly fuel? Is that something that you need to worry about or is that something that, yeah, how does that work? Well, you do in a sense uh, when our satellites come to end of life, uh, say in you know the late 2030s when our satellites start running out of fuel and they start failing, then we have to deorbit them very quickly. So we... Our last generation of satellites, we, we deorbited within a month. And it's important that you build satellites today to completely burn up in the atmosphere and not have any dangerous chemicals yeah. to add to the Raining atmosphere. down, yeah. So, so we do that, and it's important that um, they, may, they be made of materials that, um, that really don't add uh, dangerous chemicals or something like that. Uh, that's one reason like... The fuel in satellites is something called hydrazine, which is very, very dangerous. You have to be in full hazmat suits to even fuel a satellite. 
Um, but you need very little of it. It's very efficient fuel. But we, what we want to do is burn it all up in space, you know, in our uh, and make sure that there is no extra hydrazine left over. So when it burns up in the atmosphere, there isn't any hydrazine added, added okay. to the atmosphere. So there are things like that that we're we're doing to be careful and uh, and not add any any dangers. But every satellite goes up with only a certain amount of fuel, mm -hmm. and it needs fuel to kind of move itself around. Not much. It only needs a tiny little puff of uh, to move it one direction or another once it's in orbit. But still, eventually, you run out of, uh, of fuel. Even uh, the sun actually creates wind. You don't realize it, but those yeah, solar ions wind, yeah. the wind. It's called solar wind. And actually, satellites with their big um, solar rays actually sail a little bit. They actually move up and down as a result of solar wind hitting them. Very, It's very subtle, but it can be really, really important in terms of that. So all these are, are things that we manage uh, for a satellite being in, in orbit. Whoa, like, did you have, did you already have all of this knowledge in you before you joined Iridium? Was this something that you learned as time went on? Did you have to do extra, like, obviously to do extra research, you had to have meetings with experts. How was the journey like? Because now I feel like you're one of the top people that can talk to anyone about space. I think you're, no, no. like, well, amazing. Uh, no, in fact, um, no one really goes into a, any industry. I mean, certainly you can get an aerospace engineering degree or you can be an engineer or you can uh, be in material sciences. But when you get into any industry that uses that technology, there's no way you can know everything about yeah. it. So the best thing you can be is just really curious and ask great questions of your coworkers. I have a really great team that operates our satellites and and programs our satellites and engineers them and buys them from other companies. And I just love asking them questions. And I actually remember the answers. And, and, and being an engineer myself helps me sort of put it into a framework. You know, you think about it, it's almost like scaffolding. You have, mm -hmm. as you build up more and more capabilities and skills from doing things, and then you can add more things to your, your mind scaffolding and build it up. And so, and I'm fascinated by, you know, space and satellites and orbital mechanics and and uh, rockets and all that sort of thing. So as I got more and more involved in it and had issues, I would just ask lots of great questions and then people and then love the answers, you know. Nice. So so how does a day in your life look like then? Does that mean like you get up in the morning, you grab a cup of coffee, have like a super important board meeting and then go to lunch and watch a satellite launch <laughs> and then in the evening you fly to another country? How does this work? Oh boy, that sounds really good. That isn't what most people's days are like. <laughs> I do have that cup of coffee every morning when I wake up. I have to say, just one, one right now. Um, but no, I mean, I get up, uh, and I mean, the first thing I do is because we're a global business and I have people all over the world. There's a good chance there's thirty emails in my inbox with uh, <laughs> information, and so i'll read them and and uh or respond to them or delete them and say i don't really need to know that but i kind of get through i have i have obsessive compulsive disorder not bad but a little bit of ocd and i have to kind of get my inbox clean before i do anything else but i really look at the day there's you know there's lots of meetings scheduled to talk about business things or financial stuff or technical things, uh, all kinds of maybe new business opportunities. Maybe I'll have a visit from a customer. Or maybe I'll be going out to visit a customer. Maybe I'll be able to go to a conference. If I'm really lucky, I'll be at the Global Game Changers conference and I can just give a and do a panel discussion. That's a really good day, though. Today is Sunday here, so uh, I am in the office, but but, uh, oh man, we brought you into the office on a Sunday. Oh, it's on the way to the that. airport. It's okay, no problem. Um, <laughs> and um, but no, I, I I spend a lot of time walking around and talking to people and brainstorming and um, bouncing off ideas, welcoming new employees to the companies, talking to um, you know talking to people about uh, how the system is operating. You know, it's every day is different. You know, there is no program. Uh, travel a little bit. I was in New York on on Friday, and I was in Arizona last week talking to our team out there. So uh, every every day is a new day, really. It's not, and um, and I know people think CEOs give orders and people do stuff. That isn't really the way it works. We work as a team. I do get the final vote on things, but 
what's more important is that I, I have the greatest people around me and they have ideas and we can kind of work together and agree on what, what we need to do next. And, and uh, you know, whether it's a new product that we want to invent or, or something we want to fix, or maybe, uh, maybe somebody to bring on to the team to, to do something more important with us. So it's a team event. Nice. I think teamwork is what makes the world go around, whether it it's a summit, whether it's a top 500 company, whether it's a school project, teamwork literally gets things done. Um, speaking of like teamwork, uh, I'm curious about innovation, right? Speak, like, how do you stay innovative, especially since we're making sure that you're staying relevant, inventing new things? And I'm curious if the company actually takes suggestions from young people. Like, do you have young people telling you crazy ideas that eventually become materialized and become real solutions? Well, we do have internships. And I, in fact, we had 50 college interns oh, wow. um, uh, last year working with us. And we really do give them real jobs. And they do real work and spend a summer with us. And, and, uh, and, and really, they do energize us. And a lot of them do really good, innovative new work, too, because they bring new, new ideas into the company. Um, but no, innovations really, it's not about thinking of something that's never been thought mm -hmm. of before. That doesn't happen very often. I mean, it's really, really rare. What you usually do is building on other ideas and seeing like what a real problem is that needs to be solved. Um, and so what you really got to do if you want to invent something is to understand what the problems are that, that people need solved and really understand how your problem will be significantly better than the way that anything else has done to mm -hmm. solve that problem before. And the problem is a lot of people think innovation is just about technology. It's about putting some new ideas together, but there can be innovation in the, in the business ideas, the way you, the way you, uh, uh, get something paid for. It could be about the way you market things. There's innovations oh. in all types around every kind of company. And what you really want to do is just the only way to do that is to really understand the problem. So experience helps. But even if you don't have experience, you still can ask lots of questions. And, and you know, one thing, um, you know, another person in the industry who I know, who I know, Elon Musk, he often goes back and and boils every problem down to what he calls first principles. You constantly are asking why. What's what what's so if that happens, what what's the real problem there that we're solving? And you think you're solving one problem, but that's not the real problem. The problem is underneath it. That's just a symptom of what the real problem you're solving mm -hmm. for someone is. And so you're constantly trying to peel it apart and figure out, and then you're trying to think, is this sustainable? Is this can I make enough money on it? Will people pay money for it? How do I, how do I market it? Anyway, there's a lot of ways of doing that. So I, I there, there's a lot of problems still to be solved, but I don't think people think uh, that you have to be this incredible, uh, brilliant technologist to invent something. You just have to understand the problem and think of a better way of doing it. You know, that's very insightful. I think everyone has that misconception that you need to be like the next Tony Stark or you need to have like mad scientist skills in order to invent or revolutionize the industry. But you're right. I, exactly. It's like, how do you can branding needs innovation, uh, entertainment needs innovation. There's so many things that you, you can innovate just if you think a little harder and if you're passionate about it as well, then you can find work hard to find that solution. So yeah, exactly. Some of, some of them are really small uh, when you're doing it, but they, they make, they go into big things. You know, um, we spend too much time sort of giving awards out on the really unique ones that everyone knows about, but there's a million others that are going on around the world all the time. Other innovations that are happening that are happening on a smaller scale, but are just as important uh, when you, when you think about them. So in terms of like Iridium, right? What is one of the innovations that you think that was important, but went unnoticed? Like I know Iridium launched, I think Iridium Next as well. Would you say that was something that's the most, one of the innovations that you enjoy? I wouldn't say most innovative, right? Because we're not going to do that. But what what's your take on this? Well, I mean, even that uh, launching a whole new network that, w that we didn't have all the money for. I mean, we were making money, but not enough to pay for a whole new satellite network. So we had to get innovative about raising money and and having the people who made our satellites kind of loan us money to make the satellites for us um, and convince, um, in our case, France to back back the loan for it and stuff. So there can be things even outside technology. But even today, now that we have this network that can operate 
anywhere on the planet. It started out with a satellite phone. In fact, there's one right here. Whoa! <laughs> so, so there's a satellite phone. This was the first thing, and this can anywhere in the world. You can be in the desert. You can be in the middle of the ocean on a raft. You can be any place, and and this phone will, you know, you can use it just like a cell phone. But now we've boiled this thing down to a. Um, I don't. I don't have one here, but a little device that has a Wi-Fi hotspot, and you can use an app on your phone with it. And then we right. said, well, if we can do that, why can't we just put this right into the phone itself? Why can't we have a chip? And, oh, wow. and it be able to talk. Now it can't do all the things that you'd want it, you'd want a cell phone to do because space we don't have enough capacity for that. But we can still do important things like message back and forth if you needed to talk to a rescue agency. And if you could do that straight from your phone, I mean that's a that's an innovation. And I think over the next ten years, you know, there won't be any place on Earth where you won't be able to stay connected to family, friends, and even more importantly. We said, if people can do it, why don't we connect it to trucks? And why don't we connect it to trains and oil and gas pipelines? And then, then there were buoys. And then we started saying, well, what if we could connect elephants and giraffes and and things that are endangered? So that okay. uh, fact, <laughs> one of our partners, the Smithsonian, is is tracking endangered animals and is seeing exactly where they're migrating, and then and putting it on. Well, could we make it even smaller? And then we could put it on birds, and then we could track where birds are going. Um, we're tracking right now uh, sea lions and and sharks because while you're catching fish for us to eat, you often catch sharks and other mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. animals that yep. you don't want to do. And so, how can we discover those things to invent invent uh, things that don't catch those things into our nets and whatnot? Uh, we don't we don't catch fish, but our technology can be really helpful to things like that. Um, that is super cool. Like, yeah. how, how do how do you make sure it doesn't like like slide off the sea line as it keeps swimming well, at like miles and thousands? I of just miles. was talking. Uh, you know, we were track tracking uh, giraffes, and you think you just put it around their neck, but you can't put a, uh, something around a giraffe's yeah. neck. So, so they have these antlers up there, and they actually mm -hmm. found a way of connecting to the antlers. and And the Smithsonian said they just designed one that can fit comfortably on their tail, and they don't even notice it. But oh, nice. It's really good coverage up there because they're way up above there and they can see <laughs> our satellites really well. Um, but there's so many, those are, there's little innovations around it. It's not just getting a satellite into space that's the innovation, but what do you do once you have a connection anywhere on the world? What can you do with that? What can you connect with it and uh, and track and monitor and control? And and then you can do it better and then you can do it more efficiently and, and, um, and, and uh, it can be, Either a business, or you could help people, uh, people in their lives and stuff, uh, and protect them. So that's we got to thank Iridium for that. There's nowhere in the world where we can't go and we can connect with people. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and we think okay. that you know, I think that everybody thinks cell phones will always work. But if you were ever in a place where there's a hurricane or anything, um, I mean, right now yeah. Acapulco has no communications on the ground. There are no cell towers because they all blew down in a in a hurricane so these are what people are using to to um to rescue people from the rubble and and uh at least for the first couple of days until they're able to bring in other kind of satellite systems and and uh and, and build them up uh, if you're on a ship you know and you're sailing around the ocean there's no cell tower on the ship so you need something else to connect to the internet and talk to your family or so a lot a lot of a lot of you know unique and innovative uses of sort of the technology that you can dream up when something gets invented. And that's true of AI. It's true of, of uh, all the new things that are kind of uh, coming to pass. It's not just you're inventing AI, but you're inventing things to do with AI. And that's important too. Nice. And I think the next question that we're going to have is really going to possibly, I hope, ponder you, makes you ponder into a possible industry. I don't know. I'll let the person ask you directly themselves. This is a video question from our 13-year-old apprentice, Jai. Because his is a pretty good question. Hello, Mr. Matt Dash. My name is Jai. I'm a 14-year-old Ascendance Ambassador. And in Ascendance, I'm part of the social media team and video production team where we edit videos and testimonials. And I'm a big lover of science, especially astronomy. I mean, it's amazing that there's a whole other world outside there. That's why I'm so drawn to your space debris section in the, in the GGS. So my question is for you, do you think 
instead of viewing space debris as a problem, could we view it as a resource? I mean, there is millions of kilos of scrap metal up there. Could we turn it, could we recycle it into like future space missions or building habitats up there with, that, with it? Do you think that's a real possibility? And I just want to say thank you again for t taking the time to answer my questions. Could it be? Oh man, Jai is going to have my job someday, <laughs> and I, I can't wait. Um, if you're anywhere near, I'd, I'd love to have your uh, your great thinking be part of it, and um, uh, that's that's inspirational in terms of question. It's a great idea, actually. Uh, I mean, that's the that's the idea. You look at a problem, and and you look at the problem in all different ways, and say, okay, everybody says get rid of the the debris. How do we how do we bring it down and burn it up in space, but is there some some way to use it? Is there some play, way to take advantage of it? I'd say that'd be hard. Uh, problem is mm -hmm. the, the debris is all going at 17,000 miles an hour in different directions. And so even, you know, I know you think about, can't you just have a big fly swat or a big neck like a butterfly? I was thinking like a giant magnet, you know, that was what my train of thought. <laughs> big vacuum cleaner, uh, like the movie. Uh, <laughs> space balls or something that you would just vacuum it all out of space. And believe me, people are inspired by those kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, one idea people are having is like to shoot lasers up from the ground because a laser could slow it down slightly. And if you could just hit, say, a rocket body of a second stage and you could hit it, um, you know, through a couple passes, maybe you could slow it down so it could start getting to the point where it could, it could lower its uh, trajectory and eventually burn up. Uh, using it in space, if it could all be rounded up, you know, a lot of people, uh, when you show a picture of space debris, it looks like it looks like you can't believe all the junks in space. Mm -hmm. The problem is they've made every piece of junk about the size of a country, you know, so you can see uh -huh. it because you Magnified, can't see yeah. because most junk, most junk in space is like a paint chip or a glove or a, a wrench. A glove. <laughs> you, would never, you would never see it. Um, you know, there was a lot of just junk from that astronauts actually lost uh, track of but or it could be debris from a, a satellite the size of my desk that broke up into you know a couple hundred pieces and went in different directions and each of the pieces is only this big but it's going 17,000 miles an hour and so it's lethal uh, so I don't know if I could catch that somehow and there are people right now who are inventing space tugs or mm -hmm. uh, that will go up there and maybe grapple onto the biggest pieces of space junk and drag it down or, uh, but it, like use a harpoon. Yeah, I've heard of that. Like, like harpoon. Like but fishing, the problem is, yeah. there's like a million pieces of it, and each of those, each of those missions that you would take to bring down some piece of junk might only be able to get two or three or four of them. So you need hundreds of thousands of them, and if each one of those costs even a million dollars or a couple million dollars, which is really not much money for putting something into space, unfortunately, because of the cost of getting something out of the atmosphere. Then it's going to be, um, it, it's usually not going to make too much business sense. Mm -hmm. So, I'm we're fortunate. Gravity is helping because everything has got to come towards the Earth. <laughs> uh, problem is, it's not helping enough because if it's going around the Earth and you're a certain height above it, it may take a hundred years to come down or a thousand years, mm -hmm. and that's a long, long time for it to be uh, creating mischief in the uh, in space. Um, but um, but anyway, I. I, I agree if we could think of something that certainly the biggest piece is like a rocket body. If it could be brought up into and be made into sort of a part of a living unit and brought into a space station, you know, it's not a crazy, crazy idea, but, that but anyway, pretty cool. Jai, Jai, I can tell has uh, got potential in our industry. So keep at it, Jai. I agree. I, that, like you know how you could like live in like like you know they recycle the tanks like the in in, in on Earth like sorry <laughs> bringing it back <laughs> like you could like recycle trailers and people live in that and they like do cool stuff. I think it'll be very cool to live in like an oil rocket. I don't know. That'll be like sure, sure. I just uh, you need to make air though. Don't forget you need air and you need a few <laughs> other things up there like food and water and all kinds of stuff. So I, think <laughs> I would need a few rockets. I think it would also get kind of crazy if you were only. In one small on your rocket. own yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably, probably rocket community i don't know okay uh let's talk about a little bit of fun stuff as we wind down um what would you like to see in like the aviation or space industry because you're passionate about aviation and you're involved in space and telecommunications what would you like to see happen in the next 10 years 
fly. Um, you know, oh, clearly, you I, was, I was fortunate when I was young, and I was 13 and 15 and 17, to be around when the original Apollo missions were going to the moon. And to see people walk on the moon, including you know Neil Armstrong, who is arguably the first person, well, not arguably, mm -hmm. he was the first person to jump, uh, to land on the moon and, and walk on the moon. He grew up only about 50 miles from where I grew up. Now, he was a lot older, uh, but it was so inspiring to me to know that someone that came from my state, who um, came from my part of the country in Ohio, was able to walk on the moon. And I think that kind of inspiration can lead to all kinds of investment and other people getting involved in our industry and doing stuff. So while I have no interest in going to Mars uh, or even the moon personally, I think... <laughs> I think Mars is, as um, Elon says, is a fixer upper planet at best, you know, uh, and it will be a long time before we are able to fly amongst the stars, unfortunately. Um, it's still inspiring to go there and see how to. So I hope I hope that happens. But but even closer here on Earth, um, I think there's still a lot of innovations in space that are going to make it be allow us to do more things on Earth, you know, to be able to bring broadband uh, or even any kind of communication to people in very remote, poor areas to bring their quality of life up uh, and to make it affordable so that they can actually afford it, which has never happened. That's exciting. Um, okay. As a pilot, I mean, um, I'm learning to fly a helicopter right now. I'm going to take my test here in the next month, hopefully, and I'll be a full-blown helicopter. All the best. <laughs> along with other stuff. So that's exciting. But what's really exciting in aviation right now is is batteries and electricity and uh, and automation being applied to the problem. And one of these days we'll have what's known as urban air mobility, the actual ability to get into a device that might look like a quadcopter today, but it will take you safely, maybe with not without even a pilot because software will fly it for you and be able to fly in a very dense urban environment between two locations where it might take hours to get between, but you may be able to do it minutes above the traffic. So that vision that we all saw in movies where we're mm -hmm. flying, flying cars, that's not that far away, maybe only five, 10, 15 years away. And there's a lot of people in that industry right now who are, who are a part of that. And it's not just technical problems, you know, it's air traffic control problems. It's solving the issue of where mm -hmm. do these things land? Where do they charge? Where are we going to take them off from? How can you do that safely? Uh, there's so many problems that still have to be solved. Um, so anyway, I, I can just, there's a lot still going on above the ground, you know? So I'm, I think there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, you know, drones are an exciting one for me too. You know, I'm really excited about that. Um, so many more things are being done with, autonomous drones that can think for themselves mm -hmm. and possibly uh, do jobs like dangerous oil rig um, monitoring or or gas pipeline monitoring maybe maybe delivery i don't know i'm not sure i care that much about getting my <laughs> Uber Eats my, uh, <laughs> <to a drone. laughs> delivered by a drone i can still go to the store myself but that'd be sure. pretty cool though like you open your window right next to you and like groceries come in like <laughs> uh, it would be cool i'm not really sure if that uh, that we need those little things buzzing yeah. around our houses that I agree. Like that. but still <laughs> it's exciting to think about what's possible that is true speaking of what's possible and what's real going to be real what is one myth about space that people think is true but it's not true well i i do have to say every time i watch a movie and see like battles in space and you see things blow up and you see you see vehicles turn left and turn right and kind of go like this that that is uh, nearly impossible, unfortunately, to go fast in space. <laughs> orbital mechanics and the physics uh, really aren't going to allow uh, that. So we have to take some artistic oh, license or else or else we <laughs> wouldn't do it. And nor can we take off and zoom through the atmosphere quite as quite the way that everyone would love to be able to do, um, at least not not in the next couple hundred years until we invent something uh, truly magical. The other thing, I just don't think people appreciate how big space is. It's just, um, you know, I put it in my uh, my seminar on, on space junk. So if people watch that, they'll see it. But just Earth alone, 
the size of the Earth is so massive. There's almost a billion square kilometers in the Earth. And if you just think of low Earth orbit, it's a thousand billion square kilometers just in low Earth. That's just where the debris is. A, a thousand billion is a lot of kilometers. So that's a lot of stuff. You can put a lot of stuff in there. But if you look at space, I mean, even getting to the outer skirts of our solar system, the idea that, you know, unfortunately going to other star systems and stuff like that until we invent, you know, uh, warp drives and, you know, those mm -hmm. sort of things, which isn't about inventing. It's about the energy involved of harnessing yeah. stars and stuff. I think it's a long time away for us. We just have to appreciate how important this planet is ourselves. That's true. We can dream about going other places, but we really got to fix the one we have or we'll never be able to, you know, get far enough to be able to go to those other places. So uh, let's let's keep working on things in space, but let's keep our eyes on this planet as well at the same time. I love that. I, I agree. I think, I think you make a very good point that we might not be ready for intergalactic space travel until we sort out our own planet. Like, I think that that should reflect your house is your reflects your values. So the way we kind of treat Earth is reflects how we are as people <laughs> so until we literally clean it up i don't think and your favorite show out. star trek everybody yeah. was always nice and got along at least on our <laughs> stuff. and then you know and unfortunately if we take all the problems we have on this planet and we just take them elsewhere i'm not sure what we're really doing so i hope we find ways of living together uh, better you know before we start polluting the rest of the galaxy with our <laughs> with our people that would be really sad, though, if we figured out space travel before, like like intergalactic travel before we figure out how to do waste management here on Earth, because we'll just be literally the litterers of the universe. And I think that would be the most embarrassing title to have. <laughs> Maybe there's people out there. Maybe there's aliens out there who are watching us and they're waiting for us to get to that point. And they'll they'll talk to us as soon as we we figure out how to manage ourselves in some ways. Because they, <laughs> Get a lecture from an alien. You there. You don't, don't, don't seem to know. know there's anything out there until we're ready for it. You know. Because <laughs> yeah, because we we're not high, we're, we're dirty compared to them. We don't keep our space clean. Oh man. Oh. <laughs> All right, we have two more minutes left, Matt, and it's been wonderful having this conversation with you. And our audience is having a wonderful time. I hope you are having a wonderful time. Too. I am. I have been. The last question I would like to ask you is. is what is something you wish you could tell, I don't know, 13 year old Matt, who about what, how life has unfolded before you? You know, or did 13 year olds probably better off? I don't know. <laughs> um, I would probably told him, don't even bother trying to be cool. You'll never get there. Uh, uh, <laughs> girls will eventually like you, but it, it takes a long time, uh, you know, and so don't work at it so hard. Um, I probably would say, you know, Keep building your confidence, you know, um, and um, and you know, be who be who you are. You're the right person for it. But I I, I think I think success in life is really mostly about confidence and building your confidence. And confidence comes from making mistakes, but knowing that you knowing what you did wrong and and correcting it and fixing it and and trying to be the best person you can be and. And keeping to strive to know more and to be a better friend to other people and to be a, a better uh, partner and be a better uh, classmate, being a better team teammate uh, in your work uh, force. And um, I, I knew all those. I was fortunate. I had parents who who drilled that into me and my my other five brothers and sisters, um, you know, and, and told us that we could be anything we want to. So I guess anybody who's listening right now who doesn't know that, I hope they realize it's really possible, but if somebody else isn't telling you that you are capable of it, then tell yourself, you know? I mean, you don't need somebody else telling you you can run the world, just tell yourself. And mostly it's not that you will, but you'll have confidence and you'll build up your confidence and you'll project that and other people will see um, that you're someone like Jai is there, um, who is comfortable in saying, you know what, I have questions too. I have, I have, uh, I have ideas. So anyway, maybe that's what I'd say. First of all, I would attest to the cool part. I still think you're one of the coolest people ever, but probably because I'm a nerd deep down. So I, I think I'm not, I, I look cool, but I'm a nerd. So that's fair. But maybe I'm I think getting cool in my old age. I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> I doubt it though. 
I think you gotta swap out the blazer for a leather jacket, then things will start turning around. I'm just saying. <laughs> but I think the second thing, I think you answered my question before I could even ask it, which was um after having confidence, what's the next step? And I think that's it was just things fall into place. Like when you are focused, when you are confident about yourself, when you start heading towards the direction that you are confident in, I think things will just fall into place. And I hope Well, yeah. there's no shortcut for hard work too. I mean, anybody who just says, I wanna like run the world. Um, you're not ready for it. I mean, I wasn't ready for it. Um, you, need, you need to work at it. And I hope you really aren't afraid of working hard. And if you love what you're doing, it's not work, right? And so um, do something you really love and then really be the best you can be at it. And uh, it's amazing what might happen as a result of that um, and where you might go. And then just a little bit of patience. If you're a type alpha like I was and like you are, Hira, uh, you know, sometimes just patience, you know, um, understand life will unfold and you'll be met with many forks in the road where you can go left or you can go right. And don't sweat whether you're taking the right one. Just take the one that feels right and don't worry about the one you didn't take. Just keep going in the same direction towards some goal or vision that you have or a vision of yourself. And, um, you know, who knows where you'll end up? You know, it's maybe maybe you'll be cool like me. Uh, who knows? No. <laughs> I agree. Thank you so much, Matt. That was the best way that you could have ended this roundtable. And I think all of us here are extremely privileged to be able to hear you share your experience and have you share your time with us as well. And we can't wait for the next time that we see you on screen or in person. I hope everybody has a great conference and enjoys enjoys the rest of this. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the session. Now we're bringing it back to the next keynote.